Hello, um, is anybody there? So, welcome everyone, can you hear me? I can hear you, and this is Mark Hill here, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, so this is Alex Douglas, I will be, um, I'll be hosting this event. Um, thank you Mark for, for being here, for making time for us. So, um, welcome everybody, everyone else, I'm glad to see there are several people online, I think we are 43 people on this channel right now. So um, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to introduce the, um, the workshop as a whole and uh, Mark before I, I pass the, the microphone to him. So, so, um, so this, this, is the, this keynote is part of the Young Architect, Architect Workshop or YARC, which is currently in its second iteration. It's focused on mentoring junior graduate students in computer architecture. So this workshop's goal is um, to provide general career advice and also offer the opportunity to junior students to uh, present their um, early stage research and also receive some constructive feedback from experts in the field from, uh, and as, well, as well as from peers. So to achieve these goals, we have several components in, as part of the workshop. So two keynotes, the first of which is going to take place uh, in just a minute. Uh, a panel with senior computer architects, student presentation sessions, as well as we are organizing one-on-one -on -one meetings between students and, some, and established architects. So the, uh, as you probably know, this workshop was initially planned to be co-located with ASPLUS in Lausanne, but unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, ASPLUS had to be canceled. Uh, so we decided to take this workshop online the same way ASPLUS is doing. So today we will have the workshop's two keynotes and we'll have the honor to host two amazing speakers, Mark Hill and Catherine McKinley. And so I will be moderating the first keynote. Again, I'm Alex Douglas from Georgia Tech. So, be and before I introduce Mark, who really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do so anyway. Um, let me go through just a few logistics to make this as smooth as possible. So uh, the keynote will roughly take 40 minutes and will be followed by 20 minutes of questions. There can also be questions during the presentations if there are any clarification, clarification questions, but please do keep your mics muted. And if you have a question, please type it in the chat so you can see at the bottom of your screen, there should be a menu that shows the chat feature. So open that and type your question in the chat or raise an interrupt if it's an urgent question. And I will either convey this question to Mark myself, or I will tell you to unmute, and then you can ask your question directly. So um, I just I, I'll now briefly introduce Mark before I uh, we start the, officially the keynote. So Mark Hill is a professor professor of computer science at the University of Wisconsin uh, at Madison. So his research interests include parallel computer system design, memory system design, com and computer simulation. He has received the 2019 Eckert Mockley Award and is an a, a fellow of both the ACM and the IEEE. Um, so if, any, if you know anything about caches, you almost certainly started learning about them uh, by studying Mark's seminal work on the taxonomy of cache misses. So if, if you don't know Mark from anything else, you definitely know him uh, through your early stages in computer architecture. Now, without further ado, I'm very excited to pass the mic to to. Mark, who will give us some timeless advice from the perspective of a 1980, uh, 1980s PhD student. Uh, thanks, Mark. We're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Alex. Can you hear me uh, just fine? Yes, I can hear you. So I'll, I'll, okay. I'll mute myself. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, virtually coming. I think, by the way, this talk is being recorded, so if you ask questions, uh, remember that. So the talk's gonna have two parts. The first is increasing your e research impact from my Eckert Mockley speech. And the second part is about you and your advisor. So I was actually charged by the organizers to talk about relationships with your advisor. But since I'm, I became a professor because I'm not good at listening to management advice, I decided to proceed this with another part which I think is important and not often talked about, which is sort of how to do research. In the Eckerd Mockley speech, it's traditionally about like all your accomplishments, but I wanted to make it useful to people. So I tried to talk about methods in that speech and that's what I'm gonna emphasize. And it was, the speech was well regarded last year. So let's move into that. That's the longer part. 
Okay, so why is this not advancing? Okay, we'll do it that way. Uh, okay, so uh, any of you in computer architecture or related fields know that we do a lot of work in with simulation and I'm, I'm not uh, immune to that uh, with uh, things that I developed during my PhD, Tycho and De Niro and early work as a Wisconsin professor with this really cool CM5 here, this is Wisconsin wind tunnel. CM5 had, by the way, 33 megahertz spark processors controlling some vector units. And so these were great simulators, but they were hard to distribute. So then we emphasized distributing much more and uh, with the GEMS system, and if you're newer, GEM5 in conjunction with Michigan folks. Uh, and um, these things have gone on to be sort of pretty widely used. In fact, they've reached the exalted state now that uh, GEM5 sometimes gets cited when people are explaining why they're not using it. Okay, so you might think that computer architecture is all about simulators or prototyping to test and re refine hypotheses. And if you're in a related field, you can think similarly of, of the methods that you see in your papers. Uh, but I want to remind everybody that this is just the last step in the scientific method. Okay, so the scientific method was uh, wonderfully articulated in 1620 uh, by Francis Bacon. Uh, this shows the cover of his book, Novum Orgum, uh, which has the high technology of the time, a galleon uh, sailing through the pillars of Hercules at the Straits of Gibraltar, okay? And what the scientific method is, is a way to systematize searching. And in your papers, and what I talked about in the last slide, and I won't talk about more, the sort of testing and refining hypotheses. Uh, what I want to talk about more is like, how did you get the first hypotheses and insights? Because you can't refine anything until you have something first. And well, actually, how did you decide from the infinite set of problems that you could work on, uh, what problems you should work on? Now, let me just start a timer. I forgot to do that. Um, oops. And uh, the other thing that doesn't always get conveyed in the papers is that you got to repeat these steps many times. The papers often show the final story, not, not the path taken. Okay, and a modern uh, version of the scientific method is this paper, Strong Inference from the Proceedings and other that inside and a little bit of how do you pick a problem oh that's why even no change uh fat cash is because they create an illusion that you know that's better than the technology that they're made of but there was and so we do this and who's first in some sort of um, just, but I don't think something's important to be true articulate just Great stuff. Say what? I had a hunch. Problem. Mention this. You see. This is enough. It's so fascinating. It's because you never reference them. You just left from your basic killer. Say you need to do to. Explain people spent Sora coming up three names that started with a C to make it more memorable. Now, I'd like to say this caused me to do a lot more work in the area, but in fact, the best work done soon after that, a year later by Norm Jopi, was on stream buffers and, um, and victim caches, which he credits directly uh, to the three Cs. And as Alex said, this has now made it into the undergraduate canon. Uh, now, it helps if your uh, PhD co advisor uh, co authors the textbook. But it's really important if you do simple. Many things are possible. As a second example, let's look at the insight behind uh, 
the data race free memory consistency model, which depending on where you are in your graduate program, you may or may not know what it is. So in the 1990s, uh, we were convinced that shared memory multiprocessors were here, that they were really gonna happen. And you know what? We were wrong. It didn't happen. Uh, but it turns out one of the great things about research is that you, you need to predict trends and, and inflection points, but you don't need to predict the timing of them. So that even if we were, even though we were wrong, we were ahead of our time, we got some good work done for when the products finally came. All right, so the problem we were concerned with was that uh, coherence made caches invisible. And so once they're invisible, what are you left with? Um, well, it turns out there was this great theoretical model by Leslie Lamport called sequential consistency, which said, hey, memory kind of behaved like a switch. It would go to a processor or a core, handle a memory reference or two, switch to the next one. And that's the way things should logically look. Great, except one problem. Real machines really didn't do this. They had write buffers, out of order, non-atomic stores, et cetera. And so you had this beautiful theory, but in practice, it wasn't being applied. And Albert Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So how can we do better? Well, we struggled with this for a long time. And this was early on, it was principally Sarita Abbe and I. And the breakthrough came at a talk by Bart Miller on software data race detection. And after the talk, it smelled like there was a connection between data races and these relaxed or weak models that were coming on. And, you know, but it actually took months to sort of formalize this to a deeper understanding. And this led to the notion of providing sequential consistency for programs that were data race free, and yet having hardware that could be very aggressive. And this led to a series of papers, including our first and release consisting was in the same 1990 session of ISCA. Srita moved on to help put this into high level models uh, for um, Java and C++. And now this is you know, being argued again in the GPU context. But the thing to remember is that the whole thing is based on a very simple insight made possible by attending a talk. Um, a third example, uh, in the 2000s, we once again thought that sh shared memory multiprocessors were here. In this case, we were correct, but actually for a reason that we didn't know, which was the end of Denard scaling. Uh, and a problem we were concerned with at the time was, how do you do multi-threaded programming? It was well known that locks did not compose and risk deadlock. That uh, you, uh, and they would also often make you have to see parts of an implementation that you'd love to hide on an interface. So how could you do better? Well, fortunately, there was this nascent work on transactional memory where the program could say, hey, make this section of code atomic. And the TM system would say, yes, ma'am, and make it so. The problem was that the early TM systems were very limited. They might just you know, be able to do transactions the size of write buffers, or they were pretty complex, meaning it's gonna be less likely uh, to be adopted anytime soon. So how could we do better? Well, David Wood and I and others you know, thought, you know, the key is we want to hide these hardware structures like write buffers. They can affect performance, but they should not affect like what transactions commit. And also we need to look to ways where the hardware changes are more modest because then adoption early is best, is uh, more likely. Um, so still, where do you look? Well, we took a page from uh, science and said, let's do a taxonomy, okay? So taxonomy is where you look at the existing solutions and you try to put them into categories. So in our case, our, our uh, taxonomy had um, two dimensions, each of which had two values. And if you get lost on the details of this, it doesn't matter. Uh, one dimension is conflict detection, whether you detected a conflict as soon as the memory reference was happening called eager or when, you, when the transaction was committing called lazy. The other dimension was virtual version management which the, the eager version put the new value in place and kept the old value on the side of the transaction abort and the lazy version uh, kept the new value off to the side. And one of the things we noticed was in this quadrant here where the super successful uh, database management systems, relational database management systems. And obviously they use, they're operating at a different, different technology. I mean, main memory and disks at the time, but nevertheless, they're very successful. And so we decided that this might be a good place to target our new log TM system. 
And Logjam went off to be sort of very academically successful, not yet adopted industry, but industry has adopted transactional memory in for small sizes at IBM, Intel, and recently ARM. And uh, I expect that taking the long view, you don't know what's going to happen in future decades. I would point out that data level parallelism, you know, had five decades of work through uh, vectors and uh, streaming SIMD extensions before it really took off with GPU um, SIMT. So sometimes things take time. As a, oh, I should say, taxonomies have a long history in uh, science. This is my favorite taxonomy, the mother of all scientific ta taxonomies, Mendeleev's periodic table, where he figured out by organizing the elements by atomic number, he could identify gaps, he could predict some properties of the elements, and people went off to find the, the um, elements in those gaps. So consider taxonomies. The fourth and final example of methods of doing research, uh, in the 2010s, it was clear that systems on a chip or SOCs were growing up. They had CPUs, GPUs, mini accelerators, interconnects, coherence, virtual memory, virtualization. And uh, I went on a sabbatical to uh, Google in 2018, and my manager said, uh, in the next few months, why don't you make SOC design more scientific? My first reaction was gasp. I mean, this is impossible, okay? But we did what I normally do is you'd like, how do you make some progress? You try to simplify, you can't do that whole chart, but can you do some part of it? And I went to try to do a simple model, you know, not a, like the 3C model, okay? And this model uh, with Vijay Janapan Reddy uh, is called the Gables model uh, because it builds on roof line. So, uh, what it does, roofline was originally, looks like a roofline there applied to a, a single multi-core chip. It has some information about whether you're limited by communication or compute. And we reapplied this to each of the accelerators and CPUs of a multi-core chip to have a multi-gabled roof uh, in gables. And um, this allowed us to make some progress framing the challenge of designing SOCs. Now, is this model wrong? I like to quote George Box, statistician, who says all models are wrong, some are useful. Time will tell whether this is useful, but we already saw from this model and the simple things that there are many use cases where uh, accelerators are being used in parallel. And we hypothesize now that accelerator level parallelism will be one of the uh, big uses of transistors in the future, following on the long history of using transistors in parallel. And if you look at that history, and you can ask me more about acceleration, accelerator level parallelism after the talk or in the coffee break, well, maybe not the coffee break. Uh, so this is the long history going back to the 1940s on the x-axis. And you know we started out with bit level parallelism and it, it was used from the beginning. And, but after about 64 bits increasing, it is not so useful. Instruction level parallelism started in the 1960s and it's been very effective and widely deployed in part because it's invisible to software. Then came the end of Denard scaling shown in pink here, and that really forced some more disruptive uses of parallelism visible to software. Uh, thread level parallelism took off with uh, multi-core, uh, even, even as it had niche successes back to the 1960s. Data level parallelism took off with GPU SIMT, and we hypothesize, and maybe you should consider working on whether accelerator parallelism is going to expand so that we can apply energy efficient solutions from to virtual augmented reality to uh, autonomous vehicles. All right, so this longer section here on like insights and first hypotheses, you know, how do you pick a direction to go? I'm a big fan of models, connections through talks, taxonomies, and thinking. None of this is writing a simulator or having a mechanism, it's thinking. And so don't, just because it's easy to manipulate a simulator, doesn't mean you should do it early on. Okay, so that's insight and first hypotheses. Uh, let me do a shorter section on like, how do you pick a problem in the first place? Okay, well, I think the most important thing when searching for problems is asking the question, if you can do it, will people care? Okay, no. If I can prove that P is not equal to NP, 
that qualifies, but I'm not so good at doing that. So the other criterion is that you can do it, or at least you can do some of it, okay? It's this space in the middle that, um, that you really wanna look for. And I wanna caution you against playing Jeopardy. So Jeopardy is an American game show where they put up the answer and then you come up with the question. And so people, look. I think the key is to look for change, okay? And in computer architecture, other fields may be different. Uh, that change happens uh, because there's technology change, there's use on how computers change, there's changes in other subfields like better uh, SAT solvers, okay? And the reason for looking for change is that if there's no change, problems tend to be really important but tractable or unimportant and maybe easy, but who cares, okay? So a poster child for this impressed upon me when a graduate student is the uh, work on redundant arrays of inexpensive disks for RAID. Okay, so you might think, if you know about RAID, that it's pretty cool because it uses erasure codes on blocks, rotated, and that's the cool part. That's actually not the cool part. That's the relatively easy part. The cool part is how Patterson, Gibson, and Katz recognize the problem. So it, up to the 1980s, the least expensive place to store data, large data, was on large washing machine sized disks. Suddenly PCs came along, personal computers, and the market for small disks exploded and the small disks became more cost effective. So it was reasonable to say, hey, could we store large data on small disks? The answer was no, because the small disks were not designed to be that reliable. And then when you put a whole bunch of them together, they became even less reliable. Therefore, they could only be used if you figured out a way to make them more reliable. Once you frame the problem in this way, their solutions of the rotated block erasure codes is, is almost like a puzzle. It's creative, but it's not the most creative part. So don't forget to think hard about looking for problems. Thomas Watson, founder of IBM, liked to have this thing think. Okay, other ways for getting good work done is to collaborate. So this picture shows at some scale here, some of my 160 co-authors over the years. Uh, no one has a monopoly on ideas. If you work with different people, you can get different, better ideas. And I think it's far better to struggle with dividing the credit of a home run than taking full credit for a single. Another thing, especially in computer architecture and other practical fields of computer science is to connect with industry. Beauty alone in our work is not enough. Uh, we wanna be practical. And if you connect with industry, you can't take industry solutions. That's their intellectual property, but you can take emerging problems. And I've done this um, at least three times here. So uh, here is uh, work that uh, out of Sun in 1995 and 96, where I worked on some of their coherence for large SMPs, not all the products shipped, uh, but it resulted in uh, a long series of work at Wisconsin uh, captured in this primer. And may I uh, encourage you to look at the second edition, which adds uh, GPUs and pointers to formal methods. Uh, I did a sabbatical at AMD, where I learned a lot about GPUs and their connections to CPUs. And then I've already talked about the, the Google work on mobile SOCs. So connecting to industry is a great way to uh, do this, not just sabbaticals, students going to internships, industrial affiliates meetings. All right, so that concludes the first part of the talk uh, on my advice for how to conduct research. And I think that's super important because making your research more impactful is the best way to have a satisfying career. Uh, now I'm going to segue into uh, the part that I was actually charged to do about you and your advisor. And I'm gonna structure this as five myths corrected. Okay, so who's responsible for your PhD? So one myth is your advisor is responsible for your PhD and if it's not going very well, it's his or her fault. 
This is the model that the advisor is a wizard. This is a bad model. The reality is you are responsible for your PhD. You care more than a caring an advisor. You want to seek mentoring from your advisor. You want to seek mentoring from other sources. You want to be self-examined on your work and actually on your whole life. Decide what's working, what's not working. What can you change? What do you have to tolerate because you can't change? Okay, take charge of things. This will make your PhD better and actually make you a better professional when you leave, whether you leave with a PhD or a master's degrees. Another aspect is that who manages, right? Uh, so one myth is that your advisor is the person that manages you, directs you, decides on the projects, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and um, this is also a myth, okay? The reality is, well, okay, your, your advisor does manage you, but remember, a lot of advisors are not that good of managers because in our PhDs, we're currently trained to do science, but, but not necessarily manage. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to both manage yourself and you want to manage your relationship with your advisor. Okay. When you're working with your advisor, is he or she more effective with scheduled or impromptu meetings? Does he or she like written post pre-meeting or post-meeting summaries? Does he or she like working better with steady progress or driven finishes? And some of this is your nature and you, you want to do it your way but you also want to manage that relationship. And what I have up here in the um, upper corner is this classic article from uh, 1997 on managing your boss. This was unbelievably heretical at the time. And if you do a, a web search on it, you can find the article. Okay, so you manage your PhD. Okay, work ethic. Uh, Disorganized students work well with disorganized advisors. Uh, completely false. All advisors benefit from organized students. You should endeavor to be as organized as you can. Be prepared and never waste your advisor's time. If you do this, you'd be surprised that your advisor will give you more time and more quality time. The converse is that it's very demotivating for an advisor if a student comes unprepared or asks the same question many times. Also, you definitely want to work hard, and I work hard, but you don't want to work too long because we're doing work that's creative. And some parts of our work, you know, maybe our grunt work, but a lot of it is creative and you need breaks daily, you need exercise, you need breaks weekly. I do not believe in working seven days a week. You need breaks quarterly with vacations. Uh, this will both make your work better and uh, make your life better. All right. Myth. Graduate school is easy for great computer scientists. And the corollary of this is since you're maybe having trouble, then you must not be a great computer scientist. Okay. This is a myth. Everyone in grad school has hard days, months, or even years. I have had some success, but I failed the midterm in grad student. I failed the prelim exam. My first submission was rejected. Okay, difficulty happens. A way to think about this, which I credit to Ramsey Arpachi Dusso, is that undergraduate life is fairly linear and you're an information consumer. Okay, professors work very hard to structure homework assignments and tests that stretch you and don't choke you so that you can keep learning at a reasonably constant rate. As a graduate student, you're transitioning from being an information consumer to being an information producer. And this is decidedly non-linear. There are fits and starts and times when you're productive and times when you're not productive. Also, I warn you to beware of the imposter syndrome. So this is something that affects grad students and doctors and nurses is where you look around a room and you say, wow, everyone else, they look way more competent than me. And I, I got here probably because somebody flipped a bit in the admissions process. Uh, you know what? They're probably thinking the same thing. So uncertainty is okay. Setbacks are okay. Speaking of persistence, Thomas Edison in um, talking about the challenge of developing the light bulb uh, is said to have replied, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. 
and some sources say 10,000. So, you know, failure is part of the process of succeeding. Criticism, okay. Some believe criticism is not nice that, or that the referees are idiots. My son uh, playing kid hockey sometimes would go to a tournament where the last place team would get medals. Um, I'm not in favor of this. The reality is criticism is necessary for growth. Um, you must learn to learn from criticism. If you don't learn from criticism, you will limit what you can do. Um, you should seek criticism from your friends first. They can deliver it more nicely and they can deliver it with less consequences. Far better to have them make a suggestion that you can use to keep a paper from being rejected the first time rather than learning, uh, learning about it through a rejection. And finally, use the model. The referees are not wrong. You failed to convey your ideas to them. With that model, you can make your papers better. Okay. And so this represents my advice to you uh, and uh, working with your uh, advisor. Uh, remember that goal of a PhD is to become ability to do independent work. And so uh, managing yourself and your advisor and, and being in charge is important. Being organized and working hard more than long. Difficulty is normal as grad school is nonlinear and criticism is necessary for growth. All right, my parting words, uh, you can read some about the first part of the talk in uh, uh, Sigart's blog post, Increasing Your Research Impact. And if you're interested in, in working in accelerator level parallelism, which I think is important, uh, there's also a blog post on that. Finally, um, have you heard of this work from me? Uh, SIMD cache simulation? A coherence, probabilistic write backs? Probably not. Uh, this and many other work is, you know, didn't go as far as we wanted to, even though it was really promising at the beginning. And so this is the nature of doing research. It's like a baseball player going up to bat um, who is considered unbelievably great if they can succeed. Uh, three out of 10 times, uh, but that means they fail seven out of 10 times. And with research, it might even be a lower percentage than that, but you're remembered uh, for your successes. Thank you. And that concludes my presentation. I guess we're going to try to see if we can uh, do questions as long as there are questions. And when questions end up, we can uh, um, quit early. All right. Thank you. Th th thank you very much, Mark. That was a great presentation. Um, we already have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is that I will pass the token to people who ask questions on the chat so they can ask their questions on their own. So we only have two for now. So um, while we have these questions going, um, I I, I would say people take this, you can take this time to think of questions or um, you don't need to type the questions, just mark your, um, the fact that you want to ask a question and I'll pass you the, the token. Um, so Shazin, do you want to go ahead with your first question? Yeah, thanks Mark. Can, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Mark. This is Shazi Naga from AMD Research. Um, one of my first questions to you is, uh, you mentioned that one criteria to pick problems is if you do it, people will care. Uh, could you share some pointers with us on how to classify problems as people will care? <laughs> one of the questions early students often have, early career students often have is, you know, avoiding topics that lose relevancy over time. So any thoughts on that? Well, that's, that's actually, uh, I, hadn't, I have not been asked that question before, but it's actually a, a tough one. Um, you know, I gave you some examples. I guess the key thing is to, is to ask if this, if this happens, what difference will it make and to whom? And, you know, you, you can be a little bit wrong on estimating that, but, uh, 
you're just you're just much more likely to have something impactful. You know, so for example, you know, with the transactional memory work, we we knew that locks were really hard to program, and if we could make this other way of doing it, it might help multi-threaded programming take off. And that's why we believed if we could do it, people would care. You want to ask a follow-up, as that's only a partial answer. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's uh, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, in in terms of quantifying impact, uh, in this case, I guess uh, the example that you gave, uh, uh, locks were in were hard, and if we were to fix it uh, in in an alternate way, it would impact. So, uh, uh, looking at impact, I think Amdahl's law is another way to think about it. How how much of the problem are we going after, and that can often help in quantifying how much people will care. Uh, so. Uh, I th yeah, I think that's one way to look at it. Okay. Do we have a next question? So there, there's another one from Shazin. I can ask a question I have in, so that we interleave a little bit. Um, so um, regarding failure or um, perceived failure, actually, uh, in grad school, I think is a is a, an important. A very important topic and I keep getting students who ask the same thing so people tell them that uh, you have several failures we have once before you have one success and that's normal um, so and I, I think it's a great way to think about it by looking at um, uh, for at prior work at big big names that managed to fail and ultimately succeed but uh, how do you bring well, a student in there fortunately I lost the last uh... 15 seconds of your talk your oh okay so i so how do you how do you do you have any advice for bringing students into the right mindset that uh, there is no there isn't really failure but it's more like a an advancement and how how big part of this do you think is is the responsibility of the advisor to set this right mindset okay well Let me say, it's your responsibility. If your advisor does it also, that's great, but don't, don't be blaming it on your advisor. So it's a hard thing. It's hard to fail. You didn't get into grad school because you were a lousy student, right? You got into grad school because of a lot of success. Uh, I think the way to look at it is you're trying to take it to the next level. You're going to take some shots. There's a bit of randomness. You know, if you, regardless, you are going to learn a lot. And regardless, you're going to be eligible for a really good job in industry that pays very well. In addition, there's the opportunity if things go well for more things to happen. But you just can't obsess about whether or not that extra opportunity is going to happen. You have to sort of do the work and know that at a minimum, you're learning tremendously and you're going to get a good job in industry. This is one of the blessings of our field, you know, relative to somebody getting a PhD in history where uh, there aren't very many jobs that are uh, plumb outside of academia and every advisor, you know, can sort of educate one successor. Thank you. Um, that, that, that's a, that gives great perspective and I hope students can, uh, can get inspired from this. Um, Akanksha, do you have, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, Mark, thanks for the great talk. This is Akanksha from UT Austin. Uh, I just wanted, I, I really like the part of your talk where you talked about taxonomies. I was wondering if you could share your process behind building taxonomies. Uh, how do you start, uh, you know, with all the work that's out there and when do you know you have a good taxonomy? Uh, okay, so excellent question. Um, you know, taxonomies follow the the saying by George Box that uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. So all taxonomies are wrong, some are useful. And so what you strive to do is to try to say from all the parameters that are out there, what are the things that you think are most important that have to be sort of decided first and what what do you think are secondary 
and it's a refinement process and um, you know you don't ultimately know if a taxonomy is a good one until uh, it uh, helps you do something useful and so it's not a super tight feedback loop and by the way i've developed a lot more taxonomies than i've published um, because some of them were not sort of that profound but i still think you know they're useful to help you think you know let's say you've read 12 papers on some area it's like you know it's a way to structure uh structure your thinking and by the way even like the 3c model is wrong okay um, someone else published something called anti-conflict misses right these are misses that uh you have that that go away when you move from a fully associative cache to a set associative cache and so when you get into the more subtleties it's wrong but you know for most people most of the time that wrongness is not important that the intuition from the three c's uh dominated that's a, thank you for that answer i, I guess the, my follow-up question then is how do you kind of balance uh the precision versus the intuition aspect and you know when i've tried to do this in the past that's sort of the tension and you know in one on the one hand you want to be precise and make sure that everything falls very neatly but on the other hand you want to sort of prioritize the intuitions and you know in a way that's broadly useful to most people rather than to you know be precise about every little detail of every work do you have any uh i don't know advice on that um yeah well i i would say that most people err on trying to make the taxonomy too accurate and start sacrificing insight um you know no taxonomy is going to be completely correct because it's going to you know lump things together that are uh that are not really exactly the same and so uh i guess i would try to aim for as simple as possible and and maybe it helps to say you know i'm not doing this taxonomy to publish per se i'm doing this taxonomy to give me some insight of which way to go and um, if it turns out to be really useful then i'll 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 try to publish it thanks mark yeah, and by the way, if you look at my work, most of the work that's really well known is like so simple, like, like you know, I should really even get credit for it. Like you look at the three C's, it's like, well, how is it that people didn't know this before? Shaizin, second question on collaborations. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, so my question, Mark, was uh, you mentioned that building collaborations is a good way to be part of solving interesting problems. Uh, any pointers to early career students on seeking and building collaborations? Um, so early on, I guess you're somewhat uh, underneath your advisor and uh, a thing that often works well is um, having a brand new student, you know, be a junior person on a more senior students uh, in the group's paper, right? So you may be doing some relatively grunt work, but you're helping that student. But what you're really getting out of it is you're watching close hand the research process. And so that can be very effective. Um, as far as collaboration sort of outside your group junior um, you know you can talk to people but if you have some ideas you know then i would run them past your advisor and see what he or she thinks of things because unfortunately some advisors are not that uh, amenable to collaboration um, i guess a, a final advice you didn't quite ask this but i'll, I'll answer it anyway is what about like credit um, you know, my experience is that, uh, well, first of all, by the way, between students and professors, there's no division of credit. It's multiplied. You both get credit. Uh, and so the only thing you have to worry about is among students. Obviously, if you're early on and you're a junior person on a paper, hey, you'll take that uh, authorship anywhere on the list. And then later on, hopefully do your own paper and, and the senior students not hurt at all by you being on there. Uh, if you're as co-equals, then what you want to do is you want to discuss it with the people involved. 
and sort of decide early who's responsible for what, right? A disaster is where nobody talks about this at all and you're about to ship a paper and this is the first time you're discussing who's on the author list and what the order is. That's not a good idea. Uh, far better to discuss it before because you'd be surprised like before a paper is written, people are not as uh, vehement to argue for first authorship, meaning they have to write it than they are after the paper has been written. That's 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 great advice, Mark. So uh, to uh, uh, you did cover credit as well, but the the point that I really liked initially was you said that as early career students, it's often uh, uh, might be an easier step to collaborate within your lab first uh, as you build your research profile. And uh, the, the example that you gave was junior students being part of senior students' projects. So that's uh, uh, that's great advice. Uh, Alex, do we have other questions? I could ask a next one or we could wait for... Uh... Uh, there hasn't been a question typed yet. So uh, everybody's encouraged to type a question or uh, voice their, um, the fact that they want to ask a question. So Shazin, you can, if you have another one, you can go ahead until somebody expresses that interest. Okay, <laughs> so uh, my next question to you, Mark, was uh, one of the things that students are often scared about is approaching other professors that they want to say hello to at conferences. So um, uh, any advice on that? And specifically, what is the best way to approach Mark Hill at a conference? Okay, um, well, so first of all, you should remember that all of us were uh, grad students at one time uh, approaching professors. And so if you approach a professor, it's not like they don't know what you're doing and they don't empathize with uh, what, what's happening. Um, I think, yeah, well, I, I, one thing that I found often works is if you ask people an insightful question about their work, uh, we professors love to talk about our work. Um, and uh, that shows that you're uh, in touch with things and uh, it's a good icebreaker. And then hopefully the professor will then reply back and said, that was a great question. Um, so what are you working on? Okay, and then you want to have prepared, um, you know, sort of an elevator speech of to describe what you're working on. This is something you can practice with your fellow grad students. But and you know that should be kind of like what's the problem what's my insight what's kind of some initial result and it should be you know a relatively uh, short answer like uh, a minute or two and then people can ask follow on questions or not you shouldn't go into a a, a long thing but I, I think the most important thing to remember is that you know everyone is just a person everyone pro went through the same process you know, I always try to tell students, for example, when they're giving their first conference talk that, you know, there's only two kinds of people in the audience, right? The people who once gave their first contract conference talk and understand that you're nervous and those that never have and are amazed that you can do it at all, that there's nobody in the audience saying, well, I'm hoping that this person gets nervous and fails. That's, that's great advice, Mark. So essentially for students here in the audience, uh, making a list of professors you want to say hello to and then reading a little bit about their research so that you could ask them interesting question is a good way to start a conversation uh, if you are a little nervous going and saying hello to them and then being prepared about what you want to say about your own research uh, in, in a succinct manner is again a good way to be prepared for such conversations. Yeah, thanks Mark. And I, and I just would say when I visit universities, for example, even today, I have my admin prepare a little bit of everybody's web pages and you know two pages from two papers, which I skim on the way out so that I can ask uh, some good questions. Thanks, um, I, I, I got a small spike of questions, I think, from students. So uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead, read them out. So um, the first one is, what's your opinion on uh, pursuing a PhD directly after a master's degree versus uh, seeking some industry experience first? Um, well, it's a dual-edged sword. Um, so I did a PhD right after my master's. Um, 
but then I did a you know a industry internship. Uh, there is some value in going straight through and having the uh, experience, but I would definitely do the summer internships. I worry about people who commit to summer internships so early in the year that they don't necessarily do something that's that useful. Uh, the advantage of going to industry is that you can then learn what happens out there, maybe learn that that's, you don't want a lower level job in industry and be extra motivated, uh, learn some of the important problems out there, uh, but it comes at a real risk that, you know, you get used to the larger salary and, and other life things uh, continue. Now, let's remember that a PhD is not everything. It's a, it's a way of, of learning how to advance knowledge and you can learn that in other situations, uh, but a PhD is an excellent way to do it. But so it's, it's complicated and there's, there's, no, uh, there's no simple answer. I think if you are going to go to industry, I think you know you want to first you want to have a plan that it's going to be one or two years, and you know this is the criteria you're going to just use to decide uh, to come back to grad school, uh, and then of course things can change. But uh, I'll stop there. All right. Thank you. So the next question is. Um, if you are working on the project and you're not getting any positive results for a long time, how do you know when to stop? It says my internet connection is unstable. Oh, um, should I repeat? Should I repeat the question? Yeah, I, I didn't hear anything after I stopped talking. Oh, okay. So the, the next question is, if, you, if you've been working on a project for a relatively long time without any positive results, how do you know when to stop and potentially start looking for a different project? Yeah, well, that's operationally a very difficult question, right? It's essentially asking, um, what's the difference between persistence and stubbornness? Uh, so you have to put up with some setbacks uh, because anything that's sufficiently complicated and important to crack will have some setbacks. Um, exactly when to quit, I think is hard to know. Your advisor can help. Uh, and also maybe sometimes it can help to, you know, pause something, don't necessarily abandon it, but sort of work on something else for a while. Um, I regret that I don't have any simple operational advice on that decision. It's, it's really one of the tough ones. All right, I'll quickly cycle through. We have this burst of questions but now at the close to the end. So the next question is, um, do you have advice in figuring out the right questions by reading um, published research papers? Um, advice on um, doing the right question. So, so the thing about published research papers, by the way, is that they, they can show you what people are working on. And some of them will be people working on very important problems. Some will be less important problems. So first of all, think about that, how important the problem is. Um, you know, all research papers are flawed, right? They all have to make assumptions. Uh, and uh, you, you can look for what simplifications or assumptions that they made. Sometimes a really good researcher, well, we all fail to list all of our assumptions. Sometimes they're implicit, so you have to be careful. Um, it, but you, know, there's, you can see what are the limits. Um, by the way, one suggestion for reading research papers is it doesn't hurt to read it the first time saying, I'm going to sort of believe everything this person says and really understand where they're coming from. And second time through, read it sort of with a more critical eye. There's a tendency of many people, including new grad students, to read things with a critical eye because if you can find a flaw, then you kind of, it, it, it puffs you up as a person. Uh, but that can all, if you just do that, it can also, you can miss, you know, the real contributions of something. I joke we should reject all flawless papers because they should be, they must be too incremental. 
I'll stop there, even though that's only a partial answer to the question. Um, another question from a student is um, whether you can share your personal experience on what led you to decide to pursue a PhD. Okay, well, it wasn't really such a profound plan. Um, I was the first person in my family to uh, get a bachelor's degree. Uh, and uh, at, this was from the University of Michigan. And I just, I totally loved college and learning. And I went to graduate school in part because I wanted to continue uh, learning. And I got a PhD because I wanted to continue learning and I loved it. And uh, then I tended, you know, I, I, I said, I'll tentatively try this if it works out. And then it was really somewhat the same thing for going to a university and being a professor. I was going to try this and if it works out, um, great. And, you know, I, I went to a un universities and I've been at universities for 40 years and I still find them just exciting places. Although I also enjoy my, my sabbaticals in industry. So it's not a completely profound reason, but I think in general, when you're searching for a job, you always wanna look for things where the best parts of it are very rewarding to you and the worst parts of it are sort of more tolerable. And you know, different people uh, get struck differently. Like for example, I've met many people in industry who really get deep satisfaction out of knowing that the product that they worked on is used by millions and now billions of people. I'll stop there. Thanks, Mark. So there is one last question. I'm not sure I understand completely, but I will rephrase in the best way I can. Uh, it has to do with establishing a good communication channel with your supervisor. And the question seems to be focused specifically on discussing the pros and cons of the current work in progress. So maybe it means that the students are maybe the it, from the perspective of a junior student, it might be that the student feels that they work the work they do is not going well or it doesn't have a good trajectory. How do you talk to your advisor um, about your concerns? I, I think that's what the question is about. Well, I think it's always good to be frank with your advisor. I think you can ask them, for example, um, that you would like to know what, in the advisor's opinion, is going well with their work and how do you enhance it? And what are challenges with the work and how do you, what would you suggest for making adjustments? Um, and um, I guess that's what I would say. Uh, Making, making it obviously clear that you're open to advice and giving your an advisor an opportunity to, to give it. Uh, some students you know, aren't always initially good at uh, taking advice uh, and uh, I try to work with them on that. I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I think this is very relevant to the point you made that a PhD is a, mainly a student's responsibility and not the advisor's responsibility. So the student should have the courage, even early on, to be frank and talk to their advisor. Um, so we don't have... Let me just comment on that too. Is, is one of the things I always tell advisors, by the way, and I have a talk on my website on advisors I just gave at a CRA workshop, is you, know, you never criticize a person. You only criticize actions. So, you know, you don't say you're an idiot. You say um, this uh, uncare that you took on the on the on gathering this data. I'm very disappointed in it. You know, a, per, a person is as gift as gifted as you. I would expect to do better. Okay, and so you know, be attentive to that because if your advisor is criticizing the person rather than the action, it's it's not constructive uh, because you know you can't change who you are. You can at best change your actions. Thank you, Mark, for the valuable advice. Um, so I don't see any other questions on the chat. Um, so this is the last chance if anybody who's listening has a question. We have about a minute officially. Um, so in the meantime, uh, while you're thinking of potentially a last question, I, I should mention that Catherine's uh, keynote will be on a different 
uh, Zoom channel. I posted the link in the chat. So uh, please move there if you're interested in attending that other keynote. Any questions, any last questions from the audience? Okay, it's exactly noon Eastern time. So the, I think that officially concludes this keynote. Uh, Mark, thanks again very much. Um, All right, you're very welcome. And I will post the slides on my website under talks and papers. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank, thanks everyone for, for being online for this presentation. I hope you all benefited from it and see you in the next keynote talk by Catherine McKinley. Bye everyone. Bye.